subfloors. To vent or not to vent? So what was the rationale behind this piece of work? Well, it was said that subfloor ventilation was not effective. It didn't work. However, this statement appeared to be based initially on airflow measured with an anemometer in the subfloor void and a typical subfloor void, that is, air movement in the gap between two pieces of glass with a hole in it. So what are the results of severe subfloor condensation? Well, there's one there, a couple rather, uh, severe rot, see the screwdriver embedded into the timber, it's completely gone, cellar fungus, droplets of condensate on the underside of the floorboards down at the right, more condensation and mould up on the left and you can see the arrow points to water droplets and on the right we've got condensate forming around the aperture for the air brick. The air brick can be seen, the orange plastic air brick can be seen in the outer leaf. The main excess potential sources of water in the subfloor void well, external water levels, one has to bear in mind, are common to both internal and subfloor areas. They're a common factor to everywhere. So where do we get the water then other than from outside in the subfloor void? Well, we've got internally generated moisture from the activities within the house and we have ground moisture from the oversight and of course the short length of wall if they're damp. I have excluded flooding and leaks in this presentation. They're excess sources of moisture which are not, let us say, natural. It must be borne in mind that the total water vapour in the subfloor void is actually the sum of two components. That is, the internal levels of moisture plus the subfloor generated water vapour plus the external water vapour, and this is shown in the diagram. The external water vapour is common to all parts of the building, as previously said. Therefore, in order to identify any internally generated moisture sources, we remove this common factor from our calculations. So once this is removed, we finish up with what is known as the differential or excess vapour pressure. This is a measure of potentially internal and subfloor generated water vapour only. And this can be used as a measure of ventilation of the subfloor space. The basic principle of ventilation, I've called it winter here because during the summer windows are open and other things happen, but it's the basic principle of ventilation anyway. External hair, air has a lower atmospheric moisture content than internal air. And if water vapour in the subfloor void is derived from the oversight and or the room above, subfloor atmospheric moisture should be lowered if it is therefore vented to the exterior. So the subfloor ventilation's expectations are Open vents should lower the levels of subfloor water vapour and closed vents should increase the levels of subfloor water vapour. But first of all, we need to look at the UK external atmospheric conditions. What is expected in the external atmosphere anyway? Well, as you can see from the diagram, in the colder months of the year, the external relative humidities are very high, they're around about 85%. In the summer months, they're much lower, but even then they're up around the 70% relative humidity. And indeed, if we convert those figures to vapour pressures, which is a direct measurement of the actual amount of vapour in the air, we can see that during the colder months of the year, the vapour pressures or the amount of water vapour in the external air are pretty low. Whereas in the summer, around July and August, they're very high, double effectively, than those found during the colder months of the year. So what about this basic investigation? Well, first of all, 
it must be fully appreciated that the exercise was simply to investigate any effects of opening and closing subfloor vents. It did not investigate anything else. The sites and data are therefore limited. And the data was dependent on a lot of other factors, such as those partaking in the exercise, etc. We managed to get hold of six houses. These were volunteered, plus one repeat. And the properties were in different parts of the country. All subfloor vents had to be clear externally and internally. And the vents were alternatively fully closed and opened. In other words, they were cycled over a period of time. Data loggers, temperature and relative humidity, were placed one internally, one externally, and one in the subfloor void, not less than one metre from an air brick. One of the questions that arose was with reference to the height of the external data loggers above the ground. In other words, the conditions above ground level over the first metre in height were reported to vary or thought to be vary. However, we did this simple exercise by putting data loggers above the ground to measure temperature and humidity uh, at 100 millimetres to 1 metre. And as you can see there, as far as the temperature and relative humidity goes, they didn't vary very much at all. In other words, they're effectively the same. So there was no significant difference in height with reference to the relative humidity or temperature. Similarly, we looked at the vapour pressure, converted those figures to vapour pressure, which measures the actual amount of water in the, vape, in the atmosphere. And again, we found there was no significant difference in height with reference to the vapour pressure. So there was no real problem with our people that were helping us where they placed the data logger within reason as far as height was concerned. So we then looked at the properties as a whole, the internal conditions, and there were no internal atmospheric moisture problems reported. And this figure of less than 0.5% differential vapour pressure indicated they were fine. There weren't problem properties. And there's not a vast difference between the internal atmospheric moisture levels between any of the properties. They're all fine. So, we went on then looking at our data to look at average subfloor and external relative humidity and temperature. W means that the oversight was regarded to be damp. D regards the oversight as being dry. These were basically concrete. So, in relation to the average subfloor relative humidity, these were higher where there were damp oversights higher than they were when the, where there were dry oversights. And if we look at the graphs, temperature graphs and relative humidity graphs, the, the main point here is the stability of the subfloor conditions. And this occurs in all the properties examined. This is the red line. You can see it's far more stable than internal and external conditions. It shows it in this figure. It also shows the same in this figure. And again, the same in this figure. The temperatures and relative humidities in the subfloor void are pretty stable. Very little variation. So we're now having a look at the excess subfloor vapour pressure. In other words, that which is over the internal vapour pressure. How much more water is in the subfloor void than indoors? Well, if we look at the first one, we see that opening and closing the vents reduces the level of water vapour in the subfloor void. Closing them increases the level of subfloor water vapour. This one is slightly different, but looking at it carefully, generally opening reduces water vapour in the subfloor void and closing tends to increase it. But it's a little bit more variable and not quite so easy to see. This one simply shows that the subfloor always has less water vapour than the level of water vapour within the property itself.
There's no real obvious change with opening and closing the vents. We were lucky to get somebody to measure the airspeed externally and the volume of air leaving an air brick. And we can see that we do get volumes of air leaving air brick. So if a large volume of air or a volume of air of any type is leaving an air brick, it must be getting in from somewhere. It must be getting in from somewhere. So it does indicate ventilation. What then were the overall results? Bearing in mind we had minimal samples and the data was limited. The average relative humidity, closed versus open vents. Generally, there was a higher relative humidity in damp oversights than there were in those oversights that were recorded as dry. All relative humidities are higher where the vents were closed. We go on to look at the average temperature, open versus closed vents. Generally, it was lower with the dry oversights. The average temperatures were a little bit lower with the dry oversights. But overall, they were generally slightly warmer when the vents were closed. And finally, we have the average differential vapour pressure closed versus open vents i.e. this is the subfloor level of water vapour minus external water vapour levels. That is water vapour simply generated from within the property and subfloor only. It excludes any externally generated water vapour. So what have we got? Well, the water vapour levels in the subfloor are greater where the oversight is damp. Where the oversight is damp, there is the greatest difference between opening and closing the vents. Given that the internal water vapour levels above the floor are not vastly different, the data might, and I emphasise that, might indicate that most subfloor water vapour is generated from within the subfloor void itself. Finally, it's interesting to note that where the oversight is considered dry, there is more water vapour present when the vents were open rather than closed, which is opposite to where they were in damp oversights. At this stage, the reason is unknown. The data is too limited. A very basic observation, therefore, on the exercise is, quite simply, but that it is important to appreciate that the results are based on limited data sets. This will limit things quite significantly. However, do subfloor vents make a difference to atmospheric subfloor conditions? The answer is yes, but perhaps, apparently, not always as anticipated. And in this limited study, there appeared to be three items. A distinct influence with opening and closing vents. Opening vents distinctly increased ventilation where oversights were deemed damp. Some influence relating to the condition of the oversight, that's again dry or damp. The greatest excess vapour pressure was present where the oversights are damp. And finally, possibly, there's less water vapour passing down through the floor, most water vapour originating within the subfloor structure where damp. And really, a far more detailed study on more properties are required. We need more properties to see where this is going. Finally, I would like to make a special thanks to the Property Care Association and the following for collecting the subfloor data, the six people helping. Thank you for listening to subfloors to vent or not to vent.